O Lord, who for our sake did pass 40 days and 40 nights, give to us such strength and resolve, self-control that our flesh may govern our spirit, be subdued by your almighty spirit, that we may obey your directions in righteousness and true holiness. To thy honor and glory, who livest and reignest with thee and the Holy Ghost, world without end. Amen. Well, we're in Earl Cairns, uh, Christianity through the centuries. We're on chapter 15, the hierarchical and liturgical developments between 313 and 590. He calls it the old Catholic Church in which each bishop had, had been an equal, um, and then in which the Roman church begins to gain primacy over other bishops. Also, the ritual of the church became more elaborate. The dominance of the Roman bishop. The bishop in the early church was considered as one of the many bishops who were equal to each other in rank, power, and function. Between 313 and 590, the Roman bishop came to be acknowledged as the first among equals. But beginning with Gregory's accession to the Episcopal throne, the Roman bishops began to claim supremacy over other bishops. The need for efficiency and coordination that led naturally to the centralization of power. The bishop was also considered a guarantor of orthodoxy. In addition, some of the Roman bishops of this, this period were strong men who missed no opportunity to increase their power. Historical events during this era conspired to enhance the reputation of the Bishop of Rome. Rome had been traditionally the center of the Roman world for half a millennium and the largest city in the West. After Constantine moved the capital to Constantinople in 330, the center of political gravity shifted from Rome to Constantinople. This left the Roman bishop as the single strongest individual in Rome for great periods of time. And the people of that area came to look to him for temporal as well as spiritual headship. It was a tower of strength during the sacking of the Rome by Alaric and his Visigoths in 410. Followers in his, of his, and his clever diplomacy had at least been able to save the city from the torch. The emperor at Constantinople seemed to be remote from Rome and its problems but the bishop was near at hand to exercise effective authority in meeting political and spiritual crises. When the imperial throne of the West fell into the hands of the barbarians after 476, and other Italian cities became the seat of temporal power, the people of Italy came to look at the Roman bishop for political as well as spiritual leadership. The Petrine theory based upon Matthew 16, 18 was generally accepted by 590. According to this theory, Peter had been given ecclesiastical primogeniture over his fellow apostles and a superior position, passed on by two successors by apostolic succession. The Bishop of Rome had developed a reputation for orthodoxy. Such great theologians as Cyprian, Tertullian, and Augustine were outstanding men of the Western Church under the leadership of the Bishop of Rome. The domains of the bishop had never suffered from his heretical disputes, such as had divided the East, for example, those of Arius. Indeed, the Bishop of Rome held synods in which he'd been able to develop clearly what was the orthodox position. At the meeting of Arles in 1513, it had been able to deal effectively with the Donatist problem that was causing trouble in North Africa. Of the five great metropolitan leaders, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, 
Constantinople. Only the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Bishop of Rome lived in cities of world consequence by 590. The Bishop of Jerusalem lost prestige after the Jewish rebellion in 132. And then they were overrun by the Mohammedan Islamists of the 7th century. The Bishop of Rome and Constantinople were left as the two prominent clerical leaders by 590. The Council of Constantinople 381 recognized the primacy of the Roman See. The Patriarch of Constantinople was given the primacy of honor next to the Bishop of Rome, according to the third canon of the Council of Constantinople. This was practical recognition of the Roman bishop by a group of leading clerics in the church. In the second year, the Emperor Valentinian III issued an edict in 445 AD, recognized the primacy of the bishops of Rome in spiritual affairs. What the, that bishop would enact was to be law for all. Thus, both ecclesiastical and temporal authorities in the 4th and 5th centuries recognized the claims of Rome to primacy in the church. The effective missionary work of monks loyal to Rome also enhanced the authority of the Roman church. Clovis, the leader of the Franks, was won to Christianity in 496 and became leader was the leader of the Franks and was one to Christianity. He became a loyal supporter of the Bishop of Rome. Gregory I sent Augustine to England and that monk and his successors <coughs> were able to bring Britain under the sway of Rome. Whatever missionary monks went, wherever they went, they insisted on their converts yielding obedience to the Bishop of Rome. Above all, the Roman Church was blessed with many able bishops during this era, and these men let no chance slip to strengthen their power. Damascus 1, 366 to 384, was apparently the first bishop of Rome to describe his apostolic see. The Vulgate translation of which Jerome began at Damascus's request while he was his secretary added to the prestige and occupants of the Episcopal Chair of Rome. Jerome's high opinion of the authority of his employer can be read in a letter that he wrote to Damascus in which he categorically states that the chair of Peter is the rock on which the church is built. Leo I, who occupied the Episcopal throne from 440 to 461, was the ablest document of that chair until Gregory the first took position of but took his position of 590. His abilities won for him the, the appellation the great. He was the first to be called Papas, from which our word Pope is derived. In 452 he was able to persuade Attila the Hun to let the city of Rome alone. Again in 455, when Galeric, Geyseric, and his Vandal followers from North Africa came to sack Rome, Leo persuaded them to save the city from fire and pillage. He had to agree, however, that the city would be given over to a two-week period of sacking by the Vandals. Geyseric kept his word, and the Romans looked up to Leo's one who'd save their city from complete destruction. His position further was strengthened when Valentinian III recognized his spiritual supremacy in an edict for 45. Leo insisted that appeals from church courts to bishops could be brought to his court and that his decision would be final. He defined orthodoxy and wrote against the heresy of the Manichaeans and Donatists. Even if we do not consider Leo as the first pope, 
it is fair to say that he made the claims of and exercised the powers of many incumbents of the Roman bishopric. Perhaps such power was useful in this early period in dealing with the barbarians, but later it led to corruption within the Roman church itself. The growth of the liturgy, the practical union of church and state under Constantine and his uh, successors led to secularization of the church. The Patriarch of Constantinople came under the control of the emperor, became a department of state. The influx of pagans into the church through mass conversions, movements of the era, contributed to the paganization of the worship of the church. Nominal Christians caused the church to call upon the state to help enforce discipline by the use of temporal power to punish ecclesiastical offenses. In 529, Justinian, emperor of the Eastern Empire, ordered the closing of the academy at Athens. Up until that time, pagan Greek philosophy had been taught there. Discipline became lax within the church because its resources were overtaxed in handling the many barbarians who had only been partially converted from paganism. The influx of barbarianism and the growth of episcopal power also brought many changes in the worship of the church. If the barbarians who had been used to worshiping images were to find any real help in the church, many leaders believed that it would be necessary to materialize the liturgy to make God seem more accessible to these worshipers. The veneration of angels, saints, relics, pictures, and statutes were a logical outcome of this attitude. Connection with the monarchic state also led to a change from the simple democratic worship to a more aristocratic, colorful form of liturgy with a sharply drawn distinction between the clergy and the laity. Sunday became one of the major days of the church calendar after Constantine decided that it was to be the day of civic as well as religious worship. The festival of Christians became regular about the middle of the fourth century with the adoption of the December date that had been previously used by the worshipers of Mithra. The Feast of Epiphany, which celebrated the coming of the Magi to see Christ, was also brought into the church calendar. Cretans from the Jewish sacred year, the gospel history, and the lives of saints and martyrs led to a steady expansion of the number of holy days in the church calendar. There was also an increase in the number of ceremonies that could be ranked as sacraments. Augustine was inclined to believe that marriage should be regarded as a sacrament. Cyprian held that penance was vital to the Christian life. With the increased grap gap between clergy and laity, it was almost necessary to consider ordination in, in the light of a sacrament. Confirmation and extreme unction came to be looked on as having a sacramental value of about 400. The early theological development of the doctrine of original sin contributed to the importance of infant baptism. In the beginning of the third century, Cyprian considered infant baptism as an accepted fact. Augustine especially emphasized the importance of baptism. The Lord's Supper occupied the central place in the thinking of the worshiper and order of the liturgy. In fact, it was in process of becoming a sacrifice as well as sacrament. Cyprian thought that the priest act acted in Christ's place at the communion, and that he offered a true and full sacrifice to God the Father. The canon of the Mass, which Gregory I altered slightly, emphasized the sacrificial nature of the communion service. 
by the end of the 6th century, all the seven acts which the Roman Catholic Church regards as sacraments were in use and had an exalted position in worship. The substance, the belief, sacerdotalism, the belief that the substance of the ordinance is efficacious through the priestly celebrate steadily gained ground. This led to an increasing emphasis upon the separation of the clergy and laity. The veneration of Mary, the mother of Jesus, which was to lead to the doctrines of her immaculate conception in 1854 and her miraculous assumption to heaven in 1950, developed rapidly by 590. The false interpretation of scripture and the mass of miracles associated with Mary in the apocryphal gospels created great reverence for her. The Nestorian and other Christological controversies of the fourth century resulted in the acceptance of her as the mother of God and entitled her to special honors in the liturgy. Clement and Tertullian had ascribed eternal virginity to Mary. Augustine believed that the mother of the sinless Christ had never committed actual sin. Monasticism, with its emphasis upon virginity, strengthened the idea of the veneration of Mary. These and other considerations led the Roman Church to give special honor to Mary. What at first was merely acknowledged of her exalted position as Christ's mother, soon came to believe in her intercessory powers because it was thought that the son would be glad to listen to the requests of his mother. The prayer of Ephraim Cyrus is an early instance of a formal invocation to her. By the middle of the fifth century, she was placed at the head of all saints. Festivals associated with her sprang up in the fifth century. The Feast of the Annunciation on March 25 celebrated the angelic announcement of the birth of a son to her. Candlemas on February 2, the celebration of her purification after the birth of Christ, and the Assumption on August 15, which considered her as one who ascended to heaven without death, were the principal festivals. In the 6th century, Justinian asked her intercession on behalf of the empire. A 590 shared a unique position in the worship of the Roman church. The veneration of saints grew out of the natural desire of the church to honor those who had been martyrs in the days when the church had been severely persecuted by the state. Furthermore, the pagans had been accustomed to the veneration of their heroes when so many pagans came into the church, it was almost natural for them to substitute the saints for their heroes and to give them semi-divine honors. Up to 300 celebrations at the grave involved only prayers for the repose of the soul of the saint. But by 590, prayers for them had become prayers to God through them. Churches and chapels were built over their graves. Festivals associated with their deaths gained a place in the church calendar, and legends of miracles with them developed rapidly. The traffic in relic as in bodies, teeth, hair, or bones became such a problem that it was ordered stopped in 381. The use of images and pictures in worship expanded gradually, were rapidly as more and more untutored barbarians came into the church. Both images and pictures materialized the invisible reality of the deity for these worshipers. They also had a decorative function in beautifying the church. Fathers of the church tried to make a distinction between service to these images, which was part of the liturgy, and the worship of God, but it is doubtful 
whether this subtle distinction prevented the ordinary worship for, from offering to them the worship which the fathers would reserve for God alone. Thanksgiving and penitential process, processions became part of the worship after 313. Pilgrimages at first to Palestine and later to the tombs of notable saints became customary. Constantine's mother, Helena, visited Palestine about 326 and was supposed to have found the true cross of Christ. Government aid and freedom of the worship under Constantine led to the extensive building of churches. The Christians borrowed the basilica type architecture, which the Romans had developed for public buildings devoted to business and pleasure. The basilica was a long rectangular cruciform building with a portico at the west end for the unbaptized, a nave for the baptized and chancel at the east, with the choir, the priests, and if it were a cathedral church, the bishop officiated during the service. The chancel was usually separated from the nave by a screen of ironwork. The earliest singing in the church had been conducted by a leader to whom the people gave response in song. Antiphonal singing, in which two separated choirs sang alternately, developed at Antioch. Ambrose introduced the practice of antiphonal singing at Milan, from whence it spread through the Western church. This also was an era of great preachers Ambrose in the West and Chrysostom in the East were the leading preachers. Thus far, these preachers wore no special vestments. Special vestments for the priests were to come as the people gave up the Roman type dress when the clergy retained it for church services. The importance of this era is that during it, there arose a special sacerdotal hierarchy under a dominant Roman bishop, a tendency to increase the number of sacraments and to make them the main avenues of grace and the movement to elaborate the liturgy. These things helped lay the foundation for the medieval Roman Catholic Church. And here we bring it to an end. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.